Children of God, gathered here together in this place, may the Lord fill your hearts with his gladness, with his joy, with the, the self-assurance that he has made you worthy by his own blood on the cross. Amen. Last week, we uh, had an opportunity to talk about, a little bit about what, it, what a sacrament was. We spent uh, some time looking at the history of a sacrament, going through and understanding ultimately what led Luther to his understanding of what a sacrament, how we might define it. And as Luther defined a sacrament in his small catechism, he said it had three parts. First and foremost, the institution by God. Second of all, that it is, had a physical p- portion. And third, that it was provided forgiveness of sins. Or in other words, was a means of grace. And it's important that we understand that because as we look at the, our study today, we, we, need to, we, we start with that, those building blocks, that foundation. We start out with that understanding that a sacrament as Luther defined it, was that means of grace, that forgiveness of sins. But the question that has arisen throughout the years is the question not only what a sacrament is, but who then is worthy? Who is worthy to receive this gift of God? And as we consider this sacrament, as we consider our worth, we're drawn back to our epistle lesson from 1 Corinthians today. Paul wrote, wrote, A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord Eats himself, eats and drinks judgment onto himself. Eats and drinks judgment onto himself. Certainly a concern that we've had as we've looked at this text. A concern that we've had as we've tried to determine what worthiness is. And so as we look at that, we, we, we actually can answer this question fairly simply. It's, actually, it's astounding how simple it is. But explaining the answer is what is much more difficult. Because on the one hand, you would say no one is worthy. On the other hand, you would say all people are worthy. But as I said, as often is the case in theology, we have to unpack that a little bit. We have to explain what it means to say all people are worthy or no one is worthy. And this is where the debates have come about throughout the years of the church. This is where the study has fallen because, because there's differences of opinions and differences of understanding. As we understand ourselves unworthy, it's quite clear from Scripture. Paul wrote Ephesians chapter 2, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we are dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Dead in our transgressions, unworthy, undeserving of God's gifts. Very clear there. But on the other hand, you have the end of that statement. You have the end of the statement that's echoed also in 1 Corinthians. And that is that we have been bought by the price of Christ's blood and saved by the sacrifice of the Lamb, by Jesus Christ himself, making each of us worthy. But in terms of this worthiness, that question has still come about. Because we've sought to determine how can we be truly worthy? How can someone who is receiving this, if it is indeed a gift from God, how can someone receive it to their damnation or receive it to their judgment? How can someone not receive this as a blessing if it is a gift? Because as we talk about gifts, we talk about things that are given to us that God has placed into our own lives. But let's first look at that word, unworthiness. And as Paul uses it, it's only used two times, at least the, the particular word he uses here, and in the form he uses it, it's only used two times in the Greek language, and once in verse 27, once in verse 29. And if you have your uh, bulletins handy, it might be uh, worth your time to look now at verses uh, 27 and 29, as you can see that, there Paul, that Paul uses that term, unworthiness. Well, maybe perhaps the easiest way is to look at, the, at, at what it means to be worthy. Worthy is to have value, it is to, to be worth something, to be able to be used, to be, as for instance, an old wineskin uh, is unworthy, but a new wineskin that has been prepared as, is used in, as Jesus uses the example is something that is worthy or worth its value. Uh, something that is unworthy is something that cannot, cannot be do, do what it's supposed to do. It is unable to carry out what it's supposed to carry out. And so as we look at that word unworthy, then we, we, we sought again those oppor- op- opportunities to show ourselves worthy. And in the history of the church, we see that uh, one particular thing has come up, uh, and that is the, uh, and uh, there's more than one, but uh, the first thing we're going to look at is uh, fasting. You've heard probably, and uh, maybe not so much in the Lutheran church, but in the history of the church, fasting was a regular way of preparation. 
Now, this is not a bad thing. And it, although it is in the Roman Catholic Church, fasting is the, uh, according to Canon Law 919, it is a requirement that you must fast or, for at least an hour before. Uh, this has changed over history. It used to be quite a bit longer. But in modern days, uh, it's become just one hour beforehand. Now, let's go back, though, and look and see. This is not just a Roman Catholic belief. But as we go back to Scripture, Jesus never commanded us not to fast. In fact, when he gave us the command, the command uh, concerning fasting in Matthew chapter 6, he said, rather, do so by anointing your head with oil and don't put on that sour face. Don't let other people know. Don't be a hypocrite because fasting is not about how you show yourself to others, but it's about how God is working in you, how, you, how that devotion is grow, your devotion for God uh, is, being, uh, is being brought out through, through not eating or not drinking. Now, this is also echoed in the words of the Didache, or the Book of the Twelve, which was an, er, er, an early uh, doctrinal book that, uh, that uh, was it, shortly after the first century, was uh, s- said to be a compilation of the actual disciples' writings. And they also said that fasting was a good practice. We hear these words echoed again, and even Martin Luther echoed these words of that fasting is worth, worth our while, and it is important to do in the large catechism. He wrote, Fasting and prayer etc., may indeed be an external preparation and discipline for children, that the body may keep and bear itself modestly and reverently toward the body and blood of Christ. Yet what is given in and with it, the body cannot seize and appropriate. But this is done by the faith of the heart, which discerns this treasure and desires it. Now notice that notice there, Martin Luther actually is is saying, uh, giving a strong case for fasting. But notice the end of that there. He didn't say that the fasting was what was important, but ultimately it was the faith. And this, and this is actually what brings us to, to what is most important here as we consider the question of worthiness. Because as we think about what it means to be worthy, we understand that it is not about our outward things, what we do on the outside, but it is what has been done for us, what has been done in us. And we see this, that this debate over fasting has been uh, a part of the church for years. In fact, Augustine wrote in, uh, in the 4th century, he was responding to a gentleman by the name of Janarius. He uh, says, it, he doesn't spell out who this Janarius was, but he does say, my beloved son, which perhaps would have referred to a younger uh, bishop, uh, the bishop of, uh, uh, of Naples, who w- would have been a younger man at the time of the fa- uh, when uh, when Augustine was Bishop of Hippo, but he wrote, uh, actually it was six chapters. Can you imagine writing a letter six chapters long? It almost sounds like uh, Paul's writing there, you know, writing books of the Bible but in those letters. But uh, here, uh, Augustine, writing in response to Janarius, said, For it was after that that Christ instituted the sacrament, and it is clear that when the disciples first received the body and blood of the Lord, they had not been fasting. And you'll notice that actually throughout that, in book one, uh, Augustine's book one, he goes through this and defines that, that you really do not have to fast. That again, that it is not that outward appearance. And we, uh, as we read earlier in the small catechism, we saw that Luther actually said that it is not about that, the fasting itself or those outward appearance, but rather it is the faith in the words given and shed for you. And this is, again, uh, helps, us, helps to shape where we're, where, the way we're going to look at that question of worthiness. Because as we look at that question of worthiness, we see uh, that uh, you know, the, psalm, the words of the psalmist in Psalm 51 who said, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So what is the psalmist saying gives us our worth? Here, as we look at it, we see the psalmist is not saying it is about our outward fast. It's not about those, uh, an, even the anointing. It's not about uh, something that we might do, but rather it is about that repentance before God, having a broken heart and recognizing our utter need for his sacrament. And so then the question still remains then, well, well, well then how do we talk about that worthiness, that question of preparation? How can we truly prepare? Well, maybe the best way to start is to go the opposite direction. Some of the bad preparations has, have been done in the past, uh, some of the ways. And I'd like to start actually with uh, some of the confusion that was going around at the time of the Reformation. When uh, Martin Luther was uh, refor- seeking to reform the church, uh, there was a great deal of misunderstanding. And I would say it started with the fact that uh, the services were done only in Latin. Rather than actually teaching the people in a language they could understand uh, and uh, speaking in a way that the people could hear, much of the service was done in Latin, and the people could not hear it. And this included the communion liturgy. So as the communion liturgy was spoken, it was spoken in Latin. And so people, if they could hear it, could hear very little of what was said. The peop- and 
The, and I, I'll share with you maybe a, a confusion that came about from that. And that is, as the communion liturgy is spoken in Latin, hoc est corpus meum. Now, can you imagine, you maybe can hear, the, the, hear where that was uh, corrupted over time. Because as the people heard that, they maybe didn't hear all of that. Hoc est in corpus. And maybe, and this is what many scholars believe is the case, is where the word hocus pocus came from. People not understanding those actual words that were being spoken. This is Christ, this is my body. It's those hoc est corpus meum. They heard hocus pocus, or they thought something magical was happening, rather than seeing that it was the work of God happening. And this actually put a lot of pressure on the priests and the pastors, because they looked at it as though it was something that they had to be perfect, holy, and pious to do. They were so much fear and concern, and this is where the idea of the one sacrament came about, that where they could only receive the bread and the priest receive the wine for everyone, is because there was so much fear of spilling a, a small bit of Christ on the floor, a, a, a bit of the wine or a, bit, a crumb of, of the body. And so you'll notice, even as they went along, they would have a tray underneath to catch any possible crumbs. And, and it was, there was so much wrapped up in the fear of the priest and the pastor that there was confusion that they had to make it worthy. Well, there's a misunderstanding. Because as Martin Luther said, this is ex opera operato. Or in Latin, that's a Latin phrase which means apart from. Or quite literally, that it happens apart from us. The sacrament does not become the sacrament because of the fact that we speak the words of institution at a specific time. It doesn't happen when a little bell is rung. It doesn't happen exactly at one particular moment. But we know that it happens because when Christ spoke those words of institution, as we echo those words of institution today, he gave us a promise. He gave us a promise that as often as you eat and drink of my body and blood, I will be present. I will be, as, as you remember me, I will be present with you. And this is really a very important part of it. Because this also goes to our worth and how we can prepare. Because many of us, we've sought to prepare. In fact, in the history of the church, maybe you, some of you remember when this was a requirement in the Lutheran church. And, 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 throughout, and actually, it's not just in the Lutheran church, but you used to have to announce yourself before you were going to receive the communion. Before you were going to take communion, you would have to come and you would have to visit with the pastor in the study right here in the vestry. And, and, uh, and, you would, and if there were sins that you specifically needed to co uh, confess, you would do so. And if you, if you did not do that, then you could not receive communion. So you can see there is also a, a, some, a bit of a confusion there because it put it on the person. Now, I'm not saying this isn't a good practice because as, as David said in the psalm, we do need to have broken and contrite hearts. We do need to confess our sins before God. But it is not about our confession that makes the sacrament efficacious or provides a forgiveness of sins. It is not about us that makes it a means of grace. It is about God working through it. It is about the forgiveness of sins that Christ, as he said, in, with, and under this, this bread and wine will be my body and blood. I think that takes a lot of the burden off of us. But can you imagine if it was on us? How many of us can even go a moment without sinning? Here we confessed our sins at the beginning of the service. We took time to confess them, and, and we, we, at, we, were, we were absolved of our sins by God. And, but then, how many of us sinned since then? It, has anybody not sinned since then? Uh, show of hands. Yeah, me neither, actually. I, so I better put my hand down. In truth, we, we, all, we all, even if it is not in our deeds or our words, we know that in our thoughts and in our hearts, we are sinful people. And so if it was bound up in us, if it was bound up in Christ's presence being there in the sacrament, then we could never truly prepare, could we? There's no way that we could come to the altar perfectly. Every week, as we kneel before the altar, we kneel together as sin sinners. We kneel together as those who have broken God's law, as those who have not kept his law even for, for a moment. We are people who, as often as we tried to prepare, even if we tried for a, a day, a week, a month, even a year or years, could we ever truly be prepared? Well, we know that we couldn't, could we? And this gets at the problem with of preparation. Because while it is well and good to prepare for communion, which we'll get to in just a moment, we don't prepare to make ourselves worthy. Because we are unworthy. We are sinners who do not deserve it. And so as often as we try to look and see, well, who deserves it and who doesn't? Well, as we said, not one deserves it. But it is by faith in Christ Jesus. And this is where that preparation comes into play. This is where we talk about how we properly prepare. 
It is by confessing our sins before God. It is by recognition of our need for the body and blood of Christ. It is by knowing that our faith is weak and that his, and that he strengthens us. It is by coming together, kneeling together, by common faith and confession. And I think that's a very important thing because this gets at another question that's come up in the church in the past. And that is, well, what about this question of closed or close or open communion? Maybe, maybe this is only among theologians, but, uh, but I think we actually ask it, maybe not with those terms, but, well, why are some people allowed to come to the rail and some people are not? And I think this is an important time to discuss this question because it does get at that question of worthiness again, doesn't it? Are we saying that some pe- are we being as stewards of the gifts of God? That are we being gatekeepers? Are we it being exclusive? That is not the intent. But let me talk a little bit about what these 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 what it means to close communion, close communion, and open communion. First of all, close communion with a D at the end refers to a church. Uh, for instance, let's take our own church, a, a Grace Lutheran Church, and anybody who was not a member could not receive communion. Even if they were a member of another LCMS church, they would not be allowed to receive communion with us. And so when you think, and so only the believers who come together here would receive this gift. Now this is a practice that was historically practiced in the Wisconsin Synod, uh, the Wisconsin Lutheran Synod, but now they've moved away from it. Because as we see that, we, as, as they have seen, as they've come to understand there, is that that common belief, as they kneel together, there is commonality in the belief. And this is what, where we come to close communion. Close communion is actually the practice that we celebrate in the Missouri Synod. And that is that those who believe the same commune together. Those who have a commonness of belief kneel together at the rail. And so, the, and so as we kneel together on Sunday morning, we don't necessarily, it won't necessarily be only the members of this church, but it could be members of other Lutheran churches as we kneel together and take this gift. As we, as we, as we kneel together, uh, we will we'll welcome together all those who believe as we believe and have a common confession. And this is the p- official practice of Missouri Synod. Now, probably most common is what is called open communion. And open communion is that all who are present, regardless of faith or belief, may receive the Lord's Supper. And hopefully that makes you cringe a little bit. Hopefully that makes you back up a little bit. Because that suggests that all who, by faith or belief, so therefore, if a Muslim was worshiping with us this morning, we would welcome them to receive, well, to take the, take the sacrament with us. If a Hindu was worshiping with us, if it was worshiping with us, Anyone, even an atheist, we would welcome to them to take the sacrament. But the reason we don't is not to be exclusive. Rather, because see those of First Corinthians, it says that those who, that there were those who were taking it to their judgment, and this is why we actually practice close communion. Is because we don't want people to take the the Lord's Supper to their judgment. Well, we receive it as a gift as believers. Those who do not believe, those who do not have a have understand that the, the 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 word of God, understand the the this precious sacrament, they receive it in onto their judgment. And so we do not do this. We, the, the Missouri Synod does not practice close communion to be exclusive, to be a gatekeeper, but to be a good steward, protecting those who do not understand. And this is interesting because as you see, as, and the, just to digress for a moment, as we see this, we do see a great world who understands the purpose. Reason. They understand the reason this for others, and so this you're exclu- because you're being exclusive. But rather we do it, again, so that those who receive it might receive it as a gift and not as a punishment. And this is a, brings up this, uh, the second point, uh, or, well, whichever point we're on here, I better keep going with just say, we'll leave points out of this. But uh, it brings up a, another thought, and that is, is Christ's sacrament truly present? Is his body and blood truly present if someone doesn't believe it is? Well, there's a misconception that it isn't, that if someone doesn't believe, well, then it's not there. But this is, as I say, a misconception. Because who does that put it on if, if, it, if it relies on the belief of the person? It puts it on us, doesn't it, again? But rather, we, but rather, if it is the power of God, and if we believe what Scripture says, that it is His Word coming to us in body and blood, His flesh coming to us, well, then we believe that it is Him who, makes, who, who allows it to happen. And so, therefore, even if someone does not believe, Christ is truly still truly present. I think that's both a, a, a part. Uh, I think that's both grace and that's both. Uh, uh, well, lo, we'll say law and gospel because it is the law side that someone who does not believe may receive that uh, receive the sacrament onto their punishment, onto their judgment. But someone who receives it onto their uh, as a believer, as someone who has faith, receives it as a blessing. 
And so as we look at this question of worthiness, as we look at our, our preparation beforehand, it's important that we don't see it as what we do, as who we are, but rather on what God has done, what Christ has done for us. In the solid declaration of the of the formula of Concord, which is in our book of Concord, um, I'm sure many of you knew that, but uh, it, it is written, and I'd like to share this with you as just as we close today. When the true essential body and blood of Christ are also orally received and partaken in this holy supper, by all who eat and drink the consecrated bread and wine in the supper, by believing as a certain pledge and assurance that their sins are surely forgiven them, and Christ dwells and is efficacious in them. It is the assurance of our faith. It is the promise of God that he will be there that gives us that assurance that we will be forgiven through this gift. And so as we come to the altar, as we receive this gift, we do so not as people deserving, not as people who are worthy, but as those who are unworthy sinners, kneeling before God who is a God of grace and a God of mercy, who has poured out his blood for us, who's given his flesh to us to eat and to drink and to be, receive that forgiveness. Let us pray. Gracious God in heaven, we know that the sacrament, your sacraments, that we don't completely understand them. We know that they are mysteries, as Paul has said. We know that as we seek to be wise stewards of them, we pray that you would give us your discernment and your guidance. We pray that as we receive these gifts, that, that we would not place the burden on ourselves, which would be too heavy to bear, but place the burden on you, O Lord on your cross where you have given your life and where you have, get, where you have uh, shed your blood that we might receive this gift. Lord, we pray that as we receive this gift today that you would fill us up and make us whole, that you would provide us the forgiveness of sins and the strengthening of our faith so that we might be prepared, prepared to go out and share your love with others. Lord, as we do receive this gift, help us to see that you have made us worthy, that you have made us holy, that you have sanctified us and set us apart. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.